Great blessing. It was a, a blessing to hear Brother Gary last week. I'm looking forward to tonight. And uh, Brother DJ is going to come preach us tonight. And he's been nothing but a blessing to this church. And uh, looking forward to hearing him. All the men were assigned text. Uh, and I know they've been working hard on it, praying over the text. So Brother DJ, come and preach to us, brother. All right. Well, good evening. It's a great privilege to be able to preach to you. I always get nervous before I go when I get the opportunity to preach, but that's okay. But um, if you would please turn with me to First uh, Samuel, chapter seventeen. This was the text, uh, the chapter that was assigned to me for our preparation uh, and delivery class. And uh, my desire tonight is that you would be challenged to. Evaluate yourself by the Word of God to see how you compare. We can always use that Word of God to see how we are doing. Okay? All right. So, there have been times through history where men or women are faced with extraordinary foes, and they face those oppositions head on. Until your faith is put on the line or put to the test, you don't always know what you are made of. As situations arise which challenge your convictions, you need to continue to move forward for the glory of God. There was a day in history to be remembered, July 1st, 1863. On this day in history, there was a three-day battle. The battle took place in Pennsylvania between the Union and Confederate troops. This was the largest battle to take place on the soil of America to this, at this point. Historians have placed the number of troops that fought there at around roughly 170,000 men. This was the costliest battle for which around 51,000 men would be casualties. The battle was an unplanned, coincidental meeting of two mass armies trying to use the same road juncture. Imagine how that, that, that could happen. 15,000 Confederate soldiers would charge against the Union forces to try and break up the Union line on that first day. They are partially successful, but new reinforcements for the Union troops would fill in the gaps in the battered ranks. This charge would be later known as Pickett's Charge. Some of you guys might remember that from history there. For three days, the battle raged on, and in the end, the Confederate troops were dealt a severe blow, with General Lee losing a third of his army. The Confederates lost 28,063 men. 39, uh, 3,903 were killed. 18,735 wounded, 5,425 missing or captured. That's a lot of men. The Union troops lost 23,049 men, 3,155 killed, 14,529 wounded, and 5,365 missing or captured. That was a bloody day. The Union lines held and kept the Confederate Army from advancing further and are, yeah, the Union lines held and kept the Confederate Army from advancing further into Union territory. This battle was a turning point in the war where General Lee would now be on the defensive and try and protect his beloved South. These battles changed the face and time of, of history. Never again would the, the, the South have such a great army or an advantage to try to advance into the Northern territories that they are trying to conquer. The battle has become known as Gettysburg, a bloody and brutal battle. Men knew this going into the battle, that they may not walk out that day, and they're willing to risk it all, they're willing to lay down their life. This battle was fought for state rights and freedoms, a battle for an earthly habitation, an earthly kingdom. But today, Christian, we are engaged in a battle spiritually. For the glory of our God, for the souls of our friends and our families, for the souls of the lost that are dying around us and going to hell. We are battling as a church to be about our Father's business for whatever time He has left on this earth. We can't afford to be idle. We can't afford to be silent. We can't afford to be passive. The cost is too high to remain on the sidelines of life. There have been times when men and women have to, had to go into battle 
knowing that was going to be probably their last day alive. But they couldn't afford to be silent. They weren't going to be afford to be passive. That cost was too high to just let that go by. The name of our God is worth standing for. And the shepherd boy David was ready to go to battle. In 1 Samuel 7, we see a time when the Philistines come out and challenge Israel to battle. A time when kings come out to battle. We remember King David when he stayed home from battle, right? What happened with Bathsheba? There's a time for war. There's a time to stay home. Now, in our context here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Spirit of God had already departed from Saul, and instead an evil spirit troubled him. So Saul was already not being led by the Spirit of God. The Israelites were in a strait. They were betwixt in a hard situation. And we see David, a young boy, that is not acquainted with war, bringing supplies. Actually, I don't know how I got there. Yeah. There we go. Um, bringing supplies to his three brothers and their captains. David, seeing the situation as grievous and desperate, will rise to the occasion to meet the challenge. He has a great desire to see Israel delivered from its enemies and glory brought to the God of Israel. So, if you would, let's please stand together and let's read 1 Samuel 17. We're just going to start with just a few verses. We'll be reading some more, but I just want to start off the few verses here. 1 Samuel chapter 17 we're going to read 2 through 4. And Saul and the men of Israel will gather together and pitch by the valley Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Okay, you, you can be seated. Today, I want to preach you a message called A Time to Battle. A Time to Battle. All right. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you might use my voice, might use the time prepared, that you might minister to your people, Lord. Lord, I do pray that the urgency of what you laid upon my heart might be made manifest to them, that they might be challenged, that they might consider that time is short and there is a cause to go to battle for. Please move on our hearts, we pray in your name, Lord. Amen. Okay, so the first point we're going to see here from 1 Samuel is that there's going to be a challenge. The challenge would bring an occasion for all. And let's look at verse 8 and 9 in 1 Samuel 17. And he stood, this is going to be, a, um, this is going to be Goliath here. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. So our first point is that there is a challenge, and it brings an occasion for all. This challenge provided all the people an occasion to take a stand. All the men in the camp of Israel had at that same occasion to stand for their God and do battle. The challenge was for all to hear and all to respond. And we will see who responds. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, And I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's very reasonable. Paul is challenging all the believers to present their bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice, Not just some of the leaders or pastors or deacons. All, each and every one of us that are saved, children of God, are called to be about His service. We don't get a pass. We don't, get it. We don't have an excuse. We're all called to be witnesses. Just like all in the Bible means all, not just the elect, not just the few. It means each and every one of us. When God uses the word all, he means all, every one of us. And that doesn't change. Oftentimes we're willing to let someone else deal with the responsibility, like a pastor or a deacon or an elder, and not take that upon themselves. 
We have an occasion to stand for our God, but will we? Are we ashamed? That's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Romans 1.16 tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 1 Corinthians 16.13 also tells us, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men or behave like men. Today, most Christian men don't know how to conduct themselves as men. We're living in a day where men don't know how to be men. They need some godly men to stand up and show what a man of God looks like. And that begins with us here at Lighthouse. And I'm not saying we're the only place, but because we are here and you can hear my voice, it needs to begin here. We need some men of God that will stand up to be, say, Lord, use me for whatever purpose you would have for me to do. Because there's a lost and dying world out there around us, friends. We have family. We have friends. We have neighbors all around us. We will face challenges in life. Oh, I guarantee the challenges will come. How we deal with these challenges will mean life or death, victory or defeat, joy or sorrow, rewards or loss. Our choices have eternal consequences and eternal rewards. You know, there was a famous duel, a famous challenge between Alexander Hamilton, which was a leading Federalist and a former Secretary of the Treasury named, uh, let's see, actually Alexander Hamilton was a leading former, uh, Federalist and he was the former Secretary of the Treasury. And Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr was the Vice President under Thomas Jefferson, if you remember that from history. Now both these men fought for the same cause in the American Revolution. Both of these men were founding fathers. You think, wow, they, they've got a lot in common, don't they? But Hamilton viewed Aaron Burr as a political opportunist. But yet, boy, there it is, that kind of schism's in there, <laughs> fighting with one another. So on July 11th, 1804, Aaron Burr, who the vice president from Thomas, from, under Thomas Jefferson, challenged Alexander Hamilton to a duel to defend his reputation. Now, when this duel took place, Alexander Hamilton is said to have not fired his pistol at Alan, uh, Aaron Burr, but to fire a symbolic shot into the air and resolve the matter peacefully. Well, that, that sounds great if both guys are on the same page, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but instead, Aaron Burr shot Hamilton in the stomach, for which Hamilton would die the next day. Aaron Burr was hoping to have restored his reputation that was under attack. But he, instead, he was arrested for murder, but he was actually he was acquitted on a technicality and had to flee to Europe. Aaron Burr's reputation was suspect now, and any political achievements he hoped for died with that duel. His name was no longer regarded in a positive light. Just because we are challenged does not mean this is something worth fighting or dying over. We need God's wisdom to discern the difference. David rightly viewed this as an opportunity to stand for God says in Romans 14, 8, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. So, that's, so that first point, the challenge would bring an occasion for all. But we also see in verse 10 and 11, this cause brought an opportunity. So let me go ahead and read you verse 10 and 11. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This opportunity was to face an opposition at this time in life. Sometimes you only get one chance to face certain opposition. Here was David's chance in facing the Philistine, one bigger and stronger than he had ever faced. Yes, he did face a lion, he did face a bear, but now he was facing a giant that wanted to destroy him, his family, his nation, and the glory of his God. The opportunity was to bring glory to the God of Israel. Do we view opportunities as a chance to bring God glory? If we do, this might uh, change our view towards ministering for God. If we view opportunities as a chance to to bring God glory. What if David 
was not willing to face this giant. Ever think of those consequences? Well, Israel could still be enslaved. The Philistines would be ruling and reigning over them. How do you deal with the giant difficulties in your life? Do you run and hide like the nation of Israel as they're dismayed and greatly afraid? Or are you going to be like a Joshua and Caleb who were not fearful of the giants in that promised land, but said, let us go up at once and conquer this land. Are you a Joshua and Caleb? Or are you like the Saul and the rest of the armies that cowers and runs to be afraid? Do we have the character like David to rise to an occasion, to face the opportunity and realize there is a time to battle? We need the wisdom to, to know that whether that challenge is of God or not. So this cause brought an opportunity. So we have the challenge, we have the cause, and we have David's conviction. David's conviction produced his willingness to go to battle. And let's look at verse 26 through 29 and, and also 32. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We do still serve a living God, right? Is that true? Okay, that's good. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? In verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now remember, when Saul was anointed king, he was head and shoulders above everybody else. This was a big man, a big coward. So would all of us be if we didn't have the Spirit of God residing within us too. And when that Spirit of God departed from Saul and he didn't even know they departed, he then uh, was given an evil spirit that troubled him. You know, without the Spirit of God, we all would be cowards. But when the, we have that living, the Spirit of God residing within us, we have no excuse. David didn't have what we have with the Holy Spirit uh, residing in him. The, whole, the Spirit of God would come upon people. But well, we got something better than David. We have him residing within us, leading us into all truth. So what was David's response to this? He said, is there not a cause? David's conviction caused him to go to battle. What did David say? He said, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. In James 1.22 it says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And Isaiah 119 says, now listen to this, and if ye be willing and obedient, so in one part's being willing, another part is being obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. How many times has God talked about you got blessings and curse? Choose you this day whom you will serve. So if you're willing and you're obedient, you'll eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you should be devoured with the sword. And the, the nation of Israel very much could have been devoured by the sword of the Philistines. But David, seeing the challenge, he realized the cause. And David had some conviction. He was willing, that caused a willingness for him to go. Do you have any convictions that cause you to be willing to go to battle? Jonah had some convictions, but his is kind of interesting. Jonah's convictions caused him to run the other way, to Joppa instead. Know why? Because he knew God was merciful. He knew they'd be merciful if they repented, and he didn't want the Ninevites to receive mercy. So unlike Jonah, we need to have a compassion on the lost. David's conviction produced his willingness to go to battle. And then David also has confidence in God. Verse 45 and 47. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Man, that's powerful. David knew where he stood. David knew what to stand upon. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. It wasn't that he was defying Saul and the captains and the, and the other men. It was because he was defying God. And he's defying God's army. This day will the Lord deliver thee 
into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And listen to this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword nor spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you, in, and he will give you into our hands. Boy, but if we're not willing and obedient to realize that the battle is of God, we're willing to stand for him, we'll just be devoured. We will be devoured. So it says, the Lord, he will deliver. David had that confidence in God. He knew all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Does our assembly know and live like God is over his people at Lighthouse Baptist? Do we live a life that people will know that we serve the one true living God? Is that our testimony and reputation when people look and, and evaluate and judge us? The Bible says that Man uh, looketh on the outward appearance, but God judgeth the heart. We will be judged on our outward appearance and actions. What kind of reputation do we have? Do we have a good one? Do we have one that pleases God? What does God think of us when he looks down? Does he say, well done, my good and faithful servants? I sure hope he does. I hope he sees a people here with contrite and humble spirits who want to be about our Father's business, who want to please God. There was a time, March 23rd, 1775, this man's name was Patrick Henry. He was speaking at the Virginia Convention to convince his state to send men to fight in the American Revolutionary War. That, might, that was some, a couple hundred years back, but that's really not that long. <laughs> it really is not. And Patrick Henry voiced these famous words. He said, Give me liberty or give me death. Christian, can you say Give me Jesus Christ or give me death. Will you lay it all on the line to live your life for the Savior until your death? Christians, we are just so passive. We're, li we're passive in a time that we can't afford to be passive. We're idle in a time we can't afford to be idle. The cost is too high. We carry the name of our Lord and Savior. It is His name that we represent, folks. We can't afford to allow the name of our God to be cast in the mud because of our own laziness and our own idleness. We've got a very, a very short time here on this earth. And then, finally, David's courage brings forth victory in chapter 50, or verse 50, I mean. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a st uh, stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him, cut off his own head therewith with his own sword. Now we got a sword, folks, and I hope people don't use it against us because we're so unskillful with it. Wow. All right? David didn't have a sword, a physical sword, but we have a spiritual sword. We have the Word of God, God's completed Word for us today. We have all things that pertain on the life and godliness right here in our hands. If we're willing to open it, if we're willing to receive it, we're willing to be obey. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. You know what it is about courage? Courage is contagious. When you see someone willing to live or to die, man, that does something to you. That just kind of inspires you to say, boy, if they can do it, I can do it. Imagine these men of war seeing this little shepherd boy who says, I'll go out and fight that giant. It doesn't matter that he's huge. He had a willingness to go. He's seen the challenge. He recognized the occasion. He had conviction to go. And he had the courage and confidence in God. You know, courage brings out in others gifts and abilities that may be lying dormant. They're just afraid to do it. You know, it's not easy if you go out on the streets and you preach on the streets. 
But if you've been out there sometimes and you see some of the other men doing it, you can get a boldness. Say, wow, it can be done. I can do this. And I know maybe the first few times you do it, there's a fumbling and a mumbling, and just like I'm kind of doing today. <laughs> and the words get stuck together. But you know what? We can encourage each other. We're provoking each other, right? We don't remember who the coward is, but we do remember who the victor is. And David was victorious that day. Just think about Queen Esther. Queen Esther demonstrates great courage. She approached the king when the king didn't even summon her. And I think it was somewhere like he hadn't summoned her for the last 30 days or something, maybe more. And it could cost her her life. But you know what Mordecai, a wise older man, reminded her in Esther 4.14? And he said unto her, And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Christian, have you thought that maybe you are, your state in life, isn't because it has anything to do with who you are, but it's because God wants to get the glory through you. There's a point in a time that God can get the glory to you if you'd be willing to submit and humble yourself to Him. Say, Lord, I am willing. I have confidence in you. I will go. And you have that courage to go. Queen Esther demonstrated great courage to go before the king because the cause was worth it. The nation of Israel was at risk. Haman had already had signed a decree by the king that they were going to slaughter many Jews. Esther had great courage. She risked her life in the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, Christian, who knows who you'll affect for God's kingdom at such a time as this? You know, many times Christians spend their time picking fights with other Christians in the camp, you know, in the in the assembly building, because they don't go into all the world to preach the gospel. If we would fight alongside our brethren, we would know that the enemy is the devil, and he is seeking to devour. The enemy is not our brother or sister, and the devil loves nothing more than to, for us to cut and hurt and wound each other so much so that we don't even get into the real battle. And in Ephesians 6.12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The lost world is not who we're fighting against. They're not our enemy. We are fighting against the God of this world who has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Just because... The world is God's enemies when they're lost. doesn't mean they're our enemies yet. There'll be a day when that comes, when Christ comes back and makes things right. But they're not our enemies. The devil is our enemy. The people in the world, they're lost. They're just of the God of this world. They're just doing by nature what the children of wrath are going to do. We need to have compassion on them. We need to have a love on them. And I know it's hard to when they might spit on you, they may curse you, they may say things about you, but they're really not our enemy. They're at, our enemy is their father, the God of this world. So if you start looking at folks to say that, you know, really that person, despite what they did to you, they're really not your enemy. Think of all those that, Christians that were persecuted and thrown in prison and they're beaten and tortured. How about William Will, uh, Rembrandt? Oh, not Rembrandt. William, War, what is it? Rembrandt? There you go. He's tortured in prison and he prayed for his people that were torturing him. Can you do that? Boy, that would take some strong faith. He had, a, he had a bigger vision and he recognized that these people that are torturing me, they're not my enemies. They're just serving the God of this world who they know. Our enemy is the devil. We are ambassadors for Christ. And as 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, we're not there to, to fight. We're not there to take up arms and physically defend. This is, our kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom is not of this world. One day he will come back. He will set up his throne. He will rule and reign. Right. And when he does, we will know it because we'll be coming back with him. But until that day, this kingdom is not our home. We're pilgrims passing through, and we need to keep that in our mind. We need to recognize who the enemy truly is. Because otherwise we don't. It's real easy to get vicious with the world and the loss around us. Yeah. They don't know any better. 
We have the truth. We're the ones that are supposed to know better. We're the Christian, not them. The Bible says, to get you there in 2 Corinthians, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And Christian, in closing here, we are in a strong and fierce spiritual battle, and we need each other. If we would quit fighting, cutting, and hurting each other, and we get out in the real battle, we'd recognize who that enemy is. But the problem is if we don't get out on that battlefield, we don't appreciate each other. We don't really recognize and our brothers and sisters and appreciate who they are in Christ. Now, I know we have different personalities. It's going to be a little friction. It's going to be a little sandpaper. But you know what? We're commanded to love each other. We're not so nice ourselves all, all the time. I'm not such a wonderful guy all the time. My wife can testify to that, even though she don't have to do it now. <laughs> but we should love each other. And when we get into the real battle, we know who our, our comrades really are. It's each other, the other born-again Christians. And who our enemy is. It's not the lost. The lost is being controlled by their father, the devil. If you remember that, you might have a compassion on them. You might love them in spite of what they do to you. Hebrews 10.24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Christian, it is time for us to go to battle. It's time for us to gird up our loins and be about our father's business. Recognize who our comrades are, who our uh, allies are, and recognize who the enemy truly is. David recognized that, and because of that, he, had, he could see the challenge. He could see the, the uh, occasion. He had a conviction to go out to battle. He had confidence in God, and he had the courage to step forward and do what needed to be done when all the rest of the men fainted and hid themselves for fear. Let Lighthouse be a beacon in our neighborhood here. Let us be the church and body that God wants Christians to be in this day and age that we're here for. Is there not a cause? Well, I would say, yes, there's a cause. We need to answer that call for that cause, and I hope you do. Amen, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I really enjoyed that. It was a good message, good challenge, wonderful application of a very familiar story. So praise the Lord for that. And again, looking forward to the rest of the gentlemen. Uh, we'll go ahead and be dismissed with a word of prayer. And again, we'll start up at 815 and we're going to get right into it tonight. I'll have those sign up sheets on the back uh, by Brother Jerry, again, apologize, they're handwritten, um, but I, I do want to get your names, email address, and if you're taking it for audit or for grade. Uh, so again, please sign up on those, especially if you're leaving tonight and going to do it remotely. All right, let's pray this dismissal word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for the wonderful message that we just heard tonight. And Lord, uh, we are in a battle, the battle for souls of men and women and children. Lord, I pray that we would answer that call. We would look at the example that you set before us in the life of David and his young man and, and uh, the, the message that Brother DJ preached this evening to us. Lord, I pray that we would take it to heart. And uh, Lord, I appreciate the men that I serve along. I appreciate Brother DJ and the labor and the hours that he put into this and the prayer and the work. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would use the Word of God to encourage us this week, uh, to remind us this week that we are in a battle so when we look at that person at the gas station or the grocery store, Lord, we'd realize there's a battle for their souls. And uh, may we answer that call because, Lord, we do know there is a cause. We pray that you'd bless this evening, bless the Bible Institute. And may you get the honor and glory. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.
Here, get Ashton a look.